the apple with the fall of the moon around the earth. So that's Isaac Newton, and that's what uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, mathematical pebbles, in the next couple of lectures. Now, uh, when one presents a lecture on mathematics, uh, it's very possible to lose one's class around about two-thirds of the way through the lecture, especially if mathematics is, is because it's all built like that. So the uh, psychologists tell us that uh, uh, if you draw a graph of the concentration level uh, uh, measured over here against time, then it will go something like that. Um, but if you take a break in the middle of the lecture, uh, for whatever reason, the, uh, at this stage, the concentration level when you start again will be higher and it will descend, but it won't ever get down as low as before. So I've made it a, a principle in undergraduate le lectures to always stop in the middle of the lecture, often to do a little bit of housekeeping, like the next test is on such and such a date, or don't forget the marks are up, or this homework is due, or whatever. Uh, now, there may not be housekeeping, but uh, if I um, don't have anything uh, of a housekeeping nature, I will then I'll t ten, tell an anecdote or something like that. And I've uh, got a reputation for doing this sort of thing. I think it's a very valid educational thing to do in the middle of the lecture for that reason. Um, but having been lecturers for a long time, I'm often met by somebody in the street who says, ah, you lectured maths to me in 1984. Uh, to which I reply, well, yeah, yes, well, I'm afraid I don't remember you. Yes, they, I remember that you lectured us. I don't remember any of the mathematics. <laughs> but I do remember that you told jokes during the lecture. <laughs> but I don't remember the jokes either. So that's what I, I'm doing in this series of lectures. All those little mathematical pebbles I'm going to do with uh, maybe um, venturing in, into the oceans of truth uh, between the pebbles. So let's start with numbers as symbols. Uh, now, I'm sure a lot of you play Sudoku, which when it came out was billed by the newspapers as being a game about numbers which doesn't require any mathematics. I think they said that in order to make people comfortable. Uh, it's wrong on both scores. Sudoku is not a game about numbers. It's a game about nine different symbols. So you could play Sudoku with those symbols, which would be very annoying. Uh, now, those are the symbols that appear above the digits from 1 to 9 on the keyboard. But imagine playing Sudoku with those symbols. And secondly, Sudoku embodies a whole lot of mathematics and combinatorics and possibilities and logics and all sorts of different mathematical thinking. So. Let's think of numbers as symbols. Uh, they come with a built-in ranking, one, two, three, etc. And as such, they are often used in that respect. Uh, and in the, no other, such as numbering the houses on a street. Uh, although sometimes they put the even numbers on one side and the odd numbers on the other. Um, so you have to distinguish between the two. Unless you're in Downing Street, which is famous for having number 11 next to door to number 10. Uh, and then, of course, how, um, streets are also named sometimes uh, alphabetically uh, in terms of trees, ash, uh, beach, cedar, and so on. Um, librarians, of course, use those, the number symbols and the alphabet as uh, in both to, to um, categorize and show their books. So, but numbers, uh, when you start to use them as numbers, 
need symbols. And here are the symbols that the Egyptians used uh, 4,000 years ago, hieroglyphic symbols. Um, so you had the numbers from um, one just a vertical stroke, ten a heel bone, uh, a million is a man in astonishment at such a large number. And if you wanted to make numbers, you just strung them together. It didn't have to be in any order, you just strung numbers together. Um, so if you have those numbers as symbols, that, that works very well. Uh, the Greeks and the Hebrews used their alphabets for numbers. So here you have the alphabets, the Greek alphabet and the Hebrew alphabet, which are very closely related, probably because they came from a Phoenician origin. But the Greeks would use the al alphabet alpha, beta, gamma, delta, those, num those letters to represent the numbers one, two, three, four. So you had a built-in order of the alphabet. And the Hebrew alphabet, aleph, beth, gimel, etc. Uh, that's fine. And what you do there, again, is string the numbers together. And uh, there are other little variations that you use. But you, you then you run out of numbers. You see, when you pass a thousand, now you need to invent more symbols. And it gets more complicated that way. Well, the Romans used a system which everybody thinks is alphabetical, but it's actually not. The Romans used the symbol, the vertical line for one. Uh, the V was half of a 10, uh, and the X for 10 doesn't stand for any Latin letter. It's just the symbol. Um, then you have um, C for 100. Well, it happens to be the same letter as the beginning of Kentum for 100 in Latin. Um, a D for 500, and everybody would think that they use an M for a million, for a thousand at least, uh, which is not true. The Romans did not use M. That was a medieval or much later uh, use. The Romans used a symbol which looked like a sideways eight almost, and half of that symbol was a D, which is what they used for 500. So just to demonstrate what the Romans did, um, here is a Roman pocket calculator uh, for anybody who had a pocket in their togas. It's made of metal, about the size of a little bar of chocolate. And here you see the symbols. Um, uh, one that's a bit obscure, but that's 10, 100. That's the symbol for 1,000. And then 10,000, and then uh, 10,000, 100,000, and a million. Quite a good system. And by the way, the Romans also worked with fractions. And these little beads sliding up and down on the abacus uh, are used for fractions, mainly with twelfths. So that's the Roman system, which was actually quite effective. Um, but these systems all had the disadvantage that you had to introduce more and more symbols the larger the numbers you wanted got. Now, over in um, the Americas, the Mayan civilization in what is now Mexico had a symbol of dots and lines, and that's how they, um, uh, that one, two, three, four, five, so it was five based in a sense, uh, but also 20 based. So when you got to 20, you started with the dot again. But their major um, innovation was to have a zero, because if you're going to string together a lot of these symbols, um, and you want to say 105, then you have a symbol for 100, and, but no 10s and the 5. And the Mayans had that symbol for 0. So that 20, is, that's how they'd write 20. Uh, they're reusing the dot, uh, but that indicates that it's a dot 
shifted over one to the left. Of course, what we do is use our zero symbol, uh, but we'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but that was developed totally independently and had no effect on the development of numbers and mathematics in the Western world. The Mayans also had uh, a god associated with each number. So they had those symbols as well. But these were inscribed on monuments. I mean, you, you can't do calculations with that stuff. I mean, the, the one point about number symbols is that they've got to be instantly recognizable and distinguishable quickly from other symbols. And we'll get back to that point. Um, so that was the Mayans. But going back to the Middle East and going back to 2000 BC, uh, we get to the mathematicians of ancient Babylon who uh, had a number system which fortunately has been marvelously preserved for us because they used clay tablets. And clay tablets, when baked in the sun and then get lost in the sand, are preserved and thousands of years later, you can dig up a clay tablet like that and you look at it and you say, ah, one, two, three, four, five, six. These are cuneiform letters, wedged shape letters, engraved on a wet clay, either with one end of your stick which gives the vertical, or the other end of your stick which gives the uh, going up nine, ten, then ten and one is eleven, twelve, 13, 14. That's their system. Well, that's clear enough, that, but what's happening on the right-hand side is that we've got 9, and then that's 10 and 8, which is 18. The next one is 2 10s and a 7, 27, 36, uh, um, 45, 54. It's obviously a 9 times table, and it was discovered in what turned out to be a schoolroom. 4,000 years ago. And, uh, but now you just get on here. Uh, nine sixes are 54. Nine sevens are ah, three. That means 60 with the space. And they used a base 60 system. And so it goes on from there to. Uh, nine eights are um, 63, six and ten and two, 72, 81, and so on. Until you get to nine fourteens, 126. Um, well, there's the other side of the, the same um, tablet. It just goes up. But you can see how those, that gets very jumbled. They're not easy numbers to recognize. Uh, well, it may be that some inexperienced school kid 4,000 years ago was responsible for making that tablet, but you can read the numbers off it quite easily. Um, here, more systematically, are the numbers up to 50. But the point about these numbers is, if you looked at that one and that one, uh, without my having told you that that's 49 and 58, you would actually have difficulty in, whoops, um, uh, sorry, you'd have difficulty in uh, distinguishing between 49 and 58 just by looking at them. And the point about our number system is that the symbols we used, we use are recognizably easy to assimilate and easy to distinguish. So our system using just nine digits and a zero system comes from India originally and is often referred to as the Hindu Arabic system. That doesn't actually give credit to an important transmission through Persian culture. Persians not being Arabs, of course. Um, and, but they wrote in Arabic. That's why these things are just called Hindu-Arabic numbers. 
Um, and one of the great mathematicians of that time is far better known to us through his poetry, namely Omar Khayyam. He was a very important mathematicians of, mathematician of old Persia. But what the Hindu system introduced, which was just most important, was this document dates from about 300, 400 AD, and it's got various numbers on in early forms. I just don't know what it all means, but this one over here, that's a zero. As a placeholder. So as a placeholder, the zero was introduced to separate the numbers on either side. Uh, and that's the Bakshali manuscript discovered uh, in what is now Pakistan. And the placeholder, the dot, became used in the Western world and it morphed into a zero. Or we often say O, but it's got nothing to do with the letter O of our alphabet. Um, but the point is that the Hindu Arabic system had just these nine symbols plus the zero is ten and could represent any number as long as you use the place value system. And that's what we use today. And it's very effective in recording numbers and also in um, uh, doing calculations. So let's talk a bit about the numbers. The zero, first of all, um, the English regard the number system, which then we call the natural numbers, as beginning with one, one, two, three. The French, for some reason, regard natural numbers as beginning with zero. Um, the concept of zero as a number is not the same as the concept of as the symbol zero used in number systems. Zero as a number used in arithmetic was discussed by the Indian mathematician Brahma Gupta in about 700 AD. And he was the first to discuss zero as a number in algebra and arithmetic, including the danger of division by zero, which uh, I won't go into at this stage. The, we call the zero, zero is an Arabic word, or comes from an Arabic word, which means like cipher, which means something of no consequence. The, uh, we use the word naught, spelt either uh, with an A, as in naught for your comfort, or something comes to naught, or naught, which often means zero. And strangely enough, the word ought is also used. That may have come about because an ought could become a naught in English, spoken English. And the ought there comes up in this quote, which I rather like, as a basic principle of economics. Annual expenditure, annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 1919 and six result happiness. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 20 pounds ought and six result misery. Mr. McCorber, Dickens, David Copperfield, although Mr. McCorber was absolutely hopeless at economics, uh, as the story, as we know from the stories. Um, let's say something about, oh, uh, I guess it's 57 years since we moved away from pounds, shillings and pence, but I hope I don't have to explain what those things mean uh, to this particular audience. <laughs> now, number one, it's interesting that in some languages, typically French, and German, one, uh, in French, and ein in German, is the same as the indefinite article. So that's the number one. Um, two, in English, we have the word two, of course, and the archaic twain, now encountered mainly poetically or biblically. Twain massy keys he bore metal, uh, twain massy keys he bore metal twain, 
uh, uh, sorry, two masikisi bore of metals twain. Twain were casting dice from ancient mariner. Kipling's East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Uh, biblical, each with twain, he, each one had six wings. This uh, figure in Isaiah, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. This, of course, from the um, King James Version. And Mark Twain, uh, by, the, by the Mark Twain, was a call by the river pilots on the Mississippi, and Mark Twain took his pseudonym from that call. So the word Twain is an old English word, and then I noticed that my printer at home is uh, HP LaserJet M1130 MFP Twain. Why, I'm not sure. The point is that Twain is Anglo-Saxon, and the interesting thing is that Twain is the masculine form of the word, and two is the feminine in Anglo-Saxon. Well, Tunis is a special kind of plurality. Um, in English, we have a distinction, for example, between the word both, which means two, and all, which will mean more than two. Um, and two has a special treatment in some inflected languages. So Russian takes the genitive singular for two, three, or four. So you say two of horse, three of child, four of ruble, while five takes the genitive plural. So the lower numbers are considered to be more singular than the others. And in English, of course, we have a number of words which are of plural form, which are singular, because of their inherent tunis, like trousers or glasses or compasses or lights, uh, sorry, tights, uh, scissors, pliers, secateurs. There are also special words for two in English, especially in English hunting parlance, which speaks perhaps of a very primitive origin, um, a brace of partridges, a couple of hounds. Uh, right, on to three. Uh, three in um, South Africa, in South African currency pre-1961, as I was saying, uh, three pennies, threepence in English, or threepence, was a South African a coin, which was nicknamed a tiki. It was, that word was eliminated, as the coin was, at a stroke on St. Valentine's Day in 1961 by decimalization. The origin of the word tiki is obscure. Uh, it may be Malay in origin. It's not really known, but some say it might have come from an English slang word for sixpence, namely a tizzy. Well, um, I wanted to put this picture up of a very well-known math teacher, Tiki Diago, who bore a striking resemblance to a famous clown of Boswell Circus, <coughs> whose name was Tiki. And Tiki was a, a really brilliant math teacher. And here he is, sketched by a member of his class not paying too much attention to his maths. Uh, who was sitting in the front row. He sketched it on the inside cover of his textbook, which bore the official departmental stamp. Um, John Bosch Boys High, uh, the name known today, Zapiro. And that's such a lovely cartoon. For anybody who knew Tiki, you just recognize that immediately. 1976. Now, most cultures uh, and languages count in ten because we have ten fingers. However, there are variations, typically giving a special place to twenty um, because you could use your toes as well. Uh, in English, we interestingly only start using compound numbers after 10 uh, from 13, 14. We have special numbers for 11 to 12. We don't say 1, teen, 2, teen. And the French do the same. 
and third is German, um, and Afrikaans, of course. Um, it's been suggested that this base 12 idea comes from the fact not that we've got the 10 fingers, but that we've got 12 knuckles. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you can do calculations if you work on the idea uh, using the base 12 on your fingers. And this, of course, uses a distinctly human trait that apes do not possess, namely the opposable thumb. So chimps would not be able to count like that, even though they have 12 knuckles. Um, so some languages have special words for 11 and 12, as I mentioned, French, German, Afrikaans. Uh, unlike English, Russian starts the compound number words at 11, uh, which means two on this year. Na Dishit. Dvanatsat, which means two on um, twelve, two on ten, which is twelve. And interestingly enough, when they say Dvanatsat, they are using the feminine form of two in the Russian language. Uh, by the way, it occurs to me that in English, our teenagers are those that are thirteen or older. Uh, I've never been able to work out what happens in other languages. I looked up teenager in a, in a French dictionary, didn't find a word for teenager except an explanation that it was ch uh, children over the age of 12. Um, the French uh, goes onze, deux, treize, etc. Then it becomes logical after they get to 20, but then French becomes totally illogical again when they get after 60, because 70 is 60, 10, and uh, uh, 19 and 80 is uh, 80, which means four 20s. Um, but th that's how they seem to manage. Um, another word in English for 20 is score, as in the biblical, the days of thy years are three score and 10. The word is often misused by journalists. If you've ever noticed, they will say, scores of people flock to the beaches on Boxing Day. They don't mean, you know, 20 or 40. Uh, score is 20. In Latin, 20 was viginti, and curiously, 19 was under viginti, one less than 20. But then the Romans had this curious system of counting. The Ides of March would be on the 15th, and then the day before would be called the day before the Ides of March. So one day, two day, three days, four days before the Ides of March. Uh, the calendar was uh, complicated that way. Um, Italian has an anomaly which I could never work out. In Italian, the quattrocento, which is what the art, the, uh, art people use, uh, means 400. But they don't mean 400, they mean 1400, namely 15th century. Um, American counting is a little different from English. We say 102 and they say 102. And since 9-11, we know that their calendar numbering is back to front, uh, namely uh, month, day, year, where we go day, month, year. Um, Here's a numbering system that I really like. It comes, if you want to get to sleep and count sheep, this is the numbering system you should use because it was used by shepherds in Cumbria, the north of England. Yan, can, tethera, metherer, pimp. Sethera, leathera, hovera, dovera, dick. It's interesting, the etymologists can have great fun with this because the word for five, pimp, is etymologically connected with fünf or, or five even uh, in the German, whereas dick seems to be related to decem, ten. Um, but let's look at the hover a dover a dick, eight, nine, ten. In another dialect, that would be hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse came down, hickory dickory dock. Uh, Nice little poem, which I believe is the first limerick 
when you think of it. Um, but while I'm talking about nursery rhymes, here's something uh, not quite relevant. Uh, another nursery rhyme that's got a hidden mathematical and numerical uh, context is uh, Little Miss Muffet. Here she is in a famous painting by Millet, sat on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Uh, and she's sitting here, it's not really distinctly drawn, a uh, tuffet here, sort of a mound of grass. And that's what is often referred to uh, in OP's, the famous OP dictionary of um, children's nursery rhymes. They say a tuffet was a tuft of grass. Well, it wasn't actually. If you look up old uses of English, a tuffet was a four-gallon container, which is just sort of the right thing for sitting on. Um, but let's get back to that Cumbrian numbering system, because it goes on from there to uh, um, have a read of a dick. Um, whoops, wrong way. Yanadic, Tianadic, Tetheridic, Metheridic, Bumfit. Or they might say in, the, in North Cumbrian, Bumfit. How many members of a Cumbrian rugby team are there? Bumfit, Pagum. Uh, and then they go on, Yana, but 15 is a unit, and they carry on from there until they get two gigots. Wonderful words. Uh, all, of course, of Celtic origin. So, the days of thy years are, in Cumbrian, tether a gigots and dick, which goes rather well. Now, there are other numbering systems in the Celtic languages, um, and Welsh is one. Uh, it has two numbering systems. The old numbering system was vigesimal in character counting in base 20, and got complicated. Uh, there's a new number system which is decimal and much simpler. The, um, that's 99 in the old Welsh system. Uh, it's actually uh, where are we? 4 and 15 and 4 twenties. Uh, um, four and fifteen, rather like Bumfit in Cumbrian, Celtic, of course, and four twenties and four twenty, ninety-nine. But that's not the way to count, really. It's just too complicated. Uh, but what is of interest, I think, is that um, Celtic numbering systems must have been all over England. The Roman invasion didn't seem to have any effect on that. But what did have an effect was the other colonizers, namely the Anglo-Saxon, because all the numbering words in English are Anglo-Saxon in origin. Um, and the first time you meet a word, a number word that's not Anglo-Saxon in origin is a million, namely a big thousand. Um, all the other words up to that stage are Anglo-Saxon. Um, but there is one exception which is interesting, and that's not in the, num in the numbers which we call cardinal numbers, but in the ordinal numbers. First, second, third, fourth, fifth. Second is Latin in origin. First, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, etc. are all um, Anglo-Saxon in origin. Now, Second seemed to have overtaken the Anglo-Saxon word. The Anglo-Saxon word for second is still in youth. It's uh, in use today. It's other. So we say, uh, on the other hand, on the one hand, on the other hand. Or we say, the other woman. Uh, or we say, every other day, which means every second day. So... Uh, but of all languages with counting words, Asian languages such as Chinese are most efficient. Here are the Chinese words for, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce them, sorry, because 
They have all sorts of uh, intonations and things like that. But there you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all single syllable words and all quite distinguishable in sound. And then you have the multipliers 10, 100, 1000, and 10,000. So 9247 becomes 9,000, nine, sorry, 9 times 10,000, 2 times uh, 1,000, 5 times uh, 100, 4 times, uh, four times uh, 10, and key is 7. And that's a very efficient and easily learnable system, and you string numbers together like that. Um, there is good evidence, and uh, child psychologists look in, have looked into this in some detail, that Chinese children learn their numbers, words, more quickly than English children of the same age, because they just need 13 words, while in English children, uh, uh, English uh, children need 29 words for the same range of numbers. When you think of 13, 14, 15, not being 3, 10, 4, 10, 5, 10. Then, of course, we have the irritating thing that in English, uh, 13 is easily confused with 30 if you're speaking rapidly, 40, 50. And I remember working in Old Mutual as a student. Um, when we were checking numbers with each other, you always said foti and fifti to make sure that you weren't confusing that with 14, 14 and 15. So English is not all that efficient in that respect. Germanic languages, including Afrikaans, have this curiosity of inverting the order. So they still say 4 and 20, uh, whereas in English that just remains in the number of blackbirds baked in a pie. Um, and uh, some years ago, some, somebody did research in Afrikaans children's comprehension of, and of numbers, and they found that this was a difficulty in Afrikaans. I guess on the whole, kids get through it fairly quickly. Uh, now at this stage, I'm getting out of my depth with the use of languages in early learning of mathematics. But uh, I know very little about counting, for example, in African languages, and I believe it's complicated. Perhaps that is why the cricket commentary in African language is often given in English, the scores are given in English, uh, because the numbers are complicated. Uh, then, because there's cricket on at present, I found this in my uh, record. Now, let's read this one carefully. Amla has now scored as many runs in this innings as he has scored in his entire career. career. If you subtract all the runs he'd scored in his career before starting this innings. <laughs> How true that is. Um, now, but getting back to this numbering system in African languages, and here uh, I really can't offer anything, but surely there's something serious here when right at the start of teaching mathematics in English to a black child, they have to relearn how to count in English from their complicated system in their particular home language. Now, numbers. It's about time I really got onto the uh, subject of my uh, talk, namely 666 and all that, which of course has, with Acknowledgement to Sellers and Yet Yetman's famous book of history. Um, but in the Bible, you can find lots of references to numbers. So let's have a look at the book of Genesis, which is full of this sort of thing. Whoops, no, not that one. Um, Genesis. Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah and Enoch walked, etc. All these very detailed numeration systems 
given setting out the generations of uh, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Methuselah was not Lamech's uh, father and Noah's grandfather. And if you work out those numbers, and as I say, Methuselah lived to 969 years and he died. Well, and if you work out the numbers in which he died, it turns out that Methuselah died in the year of the flood. Lamech had died earlier, his father. So why was Methuselah not taken into the ark? Well, uh, it suggested, it may be because Methuselah was rather uh, getting on a bit. His wife's not mentioned, so he was beyond childbearing age, and after all the residents in the ark had to reconstruct all our, re rebuild our civilizations. Um, so he wasn't taken into the ark. Um, there were eight on the ark, Noah, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, and, and Noah's wife, uh, all of whom are not named. Now, eight in that tradition signifies new life, resurrection, and new creation. The eight came out of the ark, and uh, granddad didn't have a place in this theory, so unfortunately, ancient tragedy seemed to have died in the flood. Um, now, in both Hebrew and Greek, as you might remember from the slide that I showed a little while ago, um, they used letters to represent numbers. So every word can be given a numerical interpretation simply by adding up the numbers that the respective letters represent. And this sort of numerology is practiced by uh, certainly scholars, biblical scholars of the Old Testament. It's called gematria, and there's an enormous literature on this subject. And uh, in certain Christian churches, it's called Bible numerics. So a little bit about Bible numerics, uh, although this one is far um, not really serious. Psalm 46. Uh, it's from an ancient uh, Psalter, I guess. If you take Psalm 46 and you count the words of the psalm from the beginning, the 46th word is shake. And if you count the words of the psalm from the end, the 46th word is spear. Shakespeare, therefore, had a hand in the Bible. In <laughs> uh, I, I thought this was a great joke, and, uh, but it does seem that there are people who really take this seriously. Uh, now, of course, Shakespeare was the premier wordsmith of his day, so he could well have been consulted. Uh, no, he couldn't. He was a playwright, lower order. The translators of the Bible, uh, the King James Version, that is, uh, were serious clerics and scholars of Hebrew and Greek. Shakespeare would not have been on that list. But it's a lovely story, and it's worth repeating, uh, even though it's not true. Um, Well, then we get on, of course, uh, 666. And here we have in the book of Revelation, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or on their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had that mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of the beast, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number, six hundred, three score and six. Book of Revelation, chapter 13. Now here's a, a lovely question. I'm sure you can catch people out on this one. It's the sort of question that occurs on that program QI. 
How many numbers are there in the Bible? Well, there's a whole book of numbers. And numbers are mentioned frequently, as we saw with the Methuselah story. How many numbers are in the Bible? New Testament and Old Testament put together. One. There is only one number in the Bible. And that is, in this context, it's the only case in the Bible where the number is written numerically, as in Greek, this case, 666. All the other words, number words, are written out in the Bible, in Hebrew or in Greek. So they are number words, I'm being pedantic here, as opposed to the number 600, three score and six. It's the only number in the Bible. Well, it's led, of course, from that context to a great deal of superstition and people are scared of that number and avoid it out of an irrational fear which has that name, or a sort of phobia. Well, of course, that just means fear of the number 666. Uh, and a, a couple who were, uh, Ronald Reagan and his wife Nancy, when they moved out of the White House after his term as president, took a house uh, and they discovered that the house was in um, Bel Air and was number 666 St. Cloud Road. They changed the number to 668. Uh, incidentally, for those who would be opposed to Reagan, Reagan's name is in, was full, in full um, Ronald Wilson Reagan. Six letters, six letters, six letters. <laughs> and we should also note that the World Wide Web is abbreviated to www. etc. 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 In uh, the W, it doesn't exist in the um, uh, Hebrew alphabet, but in Hebrew, it would be written with the sixth letter of the alphabet, Vav. Vav is number six, and six, 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 Vav, Vav, Vav in Hebrew. It's WWW 666. That's all very worrying. Um, <laughs> however, it turns out that a fragment of papyrus was discovered in two, and revealed and investigated closely in 2005. Oh, I want to say something about this first. Um, these are barcodes, of course. Uh, there was something else that when these barcodes were introduced, people were very worried about them because they said these vertical lines here, there and there and there, those three sets of vertical lines, which occur on all barcodes, are 666. And people... Oh, there was a big movement about this, this was about 25 years ago. A big protest about this. Actually, they were quite wrong in that those three sets of lines were used for the scanner to sort of adjust itself because the scanner goes across the barcode in all sorts of different directions and it calibrates itself on those three sets of lines. And the numbers themselves are not coded in that sort of naive, simple way. Uh, the numbers are coded in a, in a far more complicated way. So, uh, let's see. Uh, here you see a, two vertical lines, but that's not a six. Uh, and here again, that's not a six, it's a three. And there it's a zero. Uh, so the, the story that this barcodes, the number of the beast on all the products you were using, was biblically uh, forbidden was uh, was uh, promoted but uh, to no effect we've got barcodes with us now however it was discovered that maybe everybody was wrong
Here is a papyrus, a fragment of a papyrus, uh, which is the earliest fragment of papyrus known, and it's identified as being a fragment of the papyrus of the Book of Revelation. And it happens to be that this piece, uh, there are more fragments uh, in the collection in, I think, Oxford University. There are more fragments there, but this particular one has got the number of the beast on it. And here it is. Whoops. Sorry. Uh, there it is. Chi, the, uh, the Greek letter meaning 600, uh, and uh, that's the letter Sun P, which is an archaic Greek letter for six, but in the middle, that's Iota, which is 10. So, in that fragment of the papyrus of the Book of Revelation, the number was 616. Not 66, not 666. Uh, so the 666 could well be just a misunderstanding or a, bibli a transcription error somehow or other. Um, there have been various attempts at interpreting what 666 could mean. It's popularly said that it's Nero. Well, you've got two options. You could either use the... Uh, Latin form of the name Nero or the Greek form Neron and use the um, counting system to add up to 666. And Nero, of course, was pretty nasty to Christians, so it's a good guess that he was regarded as beastly. However, uh, many scholars say that the numbers can't represent Nero. But in either case, it looks like 666 as a number uh, has got actually an undeserved reputation. Uh, 50 less 616 should be the number to worry about, uh, but nobody does. And so on that, I think it's time to stop. Thank you. Uh, there's time for questions if anybody has them, but uh, the, uh, the counting or numbering system, those words, are they related to uh, brands and types of sheep? I I don't know, to be quite honest. Some I don't think so. They might be names of different breeds of sheep. Well, I think the Celtic number systems, which you also find the words in Scotland and in Wales, and maybe I, I so you get, I think there were, I, I didn't, I've never seen any description of that as referring to the types of sheep. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, I haven't. Um, I don't know what uh, those movies are. I don't even know whether they just used my title, Mathematical Pebbles, and have put in a couple of things that they found somewhere. So tomorrow morning, the, uh, there are three or four movies being shown and under the heading of Mathematical Pebbles. I, I wasn't consulted even. I just discovered this the other day. But I'm sure they're going to be nice because they've got a very canny team collecting and checking the movies that they show. Yeah, yeah. Those Chinese numbers, um, it looked to me as though they could be uh, put on the abacus. Uh, a different... Um, oh, a question about Chinese numbers and the abacus. Uh, you can say quite a lot about the abacus. The Chinese abacus looks a little bit like, like the Roman abacus that I showed here. There's also Japanese abacus. And uh, here's something that's actually very interesting. In Japan, they don't allow calculators in school. Finished. They do have an abacus. And they have abacus contests where they get the kids together and they give these numbers to add up as fast as they can. And it's hugely popular, even spectator sport. 
You see these numbers going up on the screen, and the children have to add them. And you get these abacus champions. They get so good at doing abacus calculations that they can do it without an abacus. Namely, they visualize the numbers on an abacus. So these numbers are flashed up on a screen like that. Uh, oh, a dozen numbers in five seconds. And they can visualize the numbers on the abacus being added up. And you see them thinking about it and their fingers are working. And they come to the total. They give the total in as quickly as that. When asked afterwards, the total is, is correct. When asked afterwards, what were the numbers? No idea. Nor have they any idea of the subtotals that must have gone on. But they are just visualizing the beads on an abacus sliding up and down, and they see the answer. So the actual calculation, there's no calculation being taking place. They're using a different part of their brain from our calculating brain, which is apparently up there. Uh, but they're using fingers. So it might be like something like coming visually, like notes on the piano to your fingers, without having to go through an analysis in the brain. But it's interesting that your, your brain up there is the same part of the brain that uh, controls your fingers. It's a huge part of the brain that controls fingers. So uh, it's fascinating how much is being investigated by neuropsychologists and numbers in the brain and how they are manipulated and how brain damaged people can handle numbers but they can't handle words or something like that. But this is a whole different area. But there's a book that I referred to in the summer school blurb called The Number Sense, which is really very worth, well worth reading. Uh, yes. You mean uninteresting whole numbers? There's no such thing as an uninteresting whole number. Well, because? If, there were, if, you, if you could divide numbers into interesting numbers and uninteresting numbers, then if that fact would be a lowest uninteresting number. There would. There would be a lowest uninteresting number, which by definition would be interesting. Uh, <laughs> by the way, uh, you, you were talking about positive numbers also, and you mean whole numbers. You see, that argument doesn't work with fractions. Because if you had a list of fractions, you might, there might not be a lowest uh, fraction. If you take all the fractions bigger than pi, uh, there's no lowest one. We, sorry? Okay. Thanks very much. Fine. Stephen, do you want? How do you translate numbers into uh, binary uh, Yes. Well, you successively divide them by two. There's a, uh, a, a topic for another five minutes of lectures. Of uh, There's a system called Russian peasant multiplication, where you take your two numbers, you double them on one side, and you halve them on the other, and then you scratch out the numbers where you had to leave a remainder and you add up and you get the, the sum, the total. So this is a, a system of multiplying any two numbers by, without knowing how to do your general tables, only knowing tables of multiplying by two, dividing by two. And it's called, called Russian peasant multiplication because in fact it is known or was known among Russian peasants. And what's actually happening there is that the division by two is effectively reducing one of them to its binary re representation. And the bits that you need that aren't crossed out, now this, probably this explanation is not very good, needs more time. Uh, but that is how you convert to binary. And it's a very easy little thing to do on a computer, which of course the computer does all the time because the computer works on on-off and everything, everything's in binary. <laughs>